I can still remember the anticipation I felt when I was nearing the end of my college preparation to become a teacher. I had worked hard at Abilene Christian University to receive my bachelor's in education. I had taken all the courses, done all the work, completed my student teaching, and graduated summa cum laude with an almost perfect GPA if it hadn't been for that British lit class. I went on to Baylor University and got a master's in education uh, with a perfect GPA, so I was ready to teach. I was ready to be in the classroom. I was ready to coach. Bring it on. But little did I know how little I knew about what it would actually mean to be a teacher. I could never have anticipated what came next. Like the night one of my students, Kim, who was in my peer assistance and leadership class, spent hours trying to find me. In the days before cell phones would have made it easy, she spent a long time trying to track me down because Hannah, another student in her PAL class, needed me. You see, earlier that evening, Hannah's mother had died tragically, and Hannah was asking for me. Or a few years later, I was in a church van on my way back from a youth group trip in Chattanooga, Tennessee, when I got a phone call from Lindsay, one of my softball players. Her first words were, Coach, where are you? Christy needs you. Christy was the very talented center fielder on my softball team. And Lindsay went on to tell me that on the night before, Christy's mom had become the victim of a home invasion that had resulted in her death. Coach, where are you? Christy needs you. Or even a few years later, I stood in a room at my church with the four adopted children of one of the best, most generous, hospitable couples I've ever known, the husband of which had spent several weeks on trial for a business scandal and who earlier on that day had been found guilty by the jury and was facing prison. And his wife and four kids were now facing at least three years without him. And I stood there watching them, watching me through tear-filled eyes, wordlessly asking, what do we do now? And I can't begin to count the students who've come to me over the years, devastated and broken because their parents have revealed that they're getting a divorce. Or that a parent or grandparent has been diagnosed with a serious illness. Or that someone they love tragically took their own life. Or that a boyfriend or girlfriend had cheated on them or had broken up with them in a blind side. Or that they were dealing with an eating disorder. Or they'd found themselves pregnant and didn't know how to tell their parents. But wait a minute, had I prepared for that? No class I'd taken at ACU or Baylor had prepared me to know what to say to Hannah or Christy or to four adopted kids about to lose a father, even if only temporarily, or how to walk alongside them in the aftermath of these tragedies, or how to break the news to Abby that her pal Lee Chance had darted out into a busy street on his bicycle only to be struck and killed by a car he hadn't seen, or how to sit with Abby at the funeral, or how to help her talk to Chance's mom and sister afterwards. No class I'd taken had helped me prepare to prepare Susie to mentor her young pal Lee Trey, whose mother was terminally ill and whose body succumbed to that thief cancer about halfway through the school year. How do you prepare to prepare a 17-year-old girl to sit with her six-year-old pal Lee through the hard hour of his mother's funeral? But I was prepared. You see, I did know what to say to Hannah and Christy and my youth group kids and Abby and Susie and to so many others. I did know how to walk alongside them through their journeys through some really difficult situations. But that preparation hadn't come through any coursework or classwork or homework I had done or any GPA I had earned or any distinction stamped on the diplomas I was really proud of or any accomplishments that lined the pages of my resume. I was prepared because I had also spent time in another classroom where my teachers had encouraged me not only to be the best student I could be, but who also instilled in me from a very early age how important it was to be the best person I could be. Those teachers, my parents. And I learned initially what it looked like to be a good person by watching my hardworking, blue-collared, check-to-check living, mechanic and seamstress parents give themselves away to help other people in need. I remember well one occasion when my father drove into our dirt driveway, his truck towing a station wagon, complete with a family inside, who he had found broken down on the side of the road. This family had lost their home to foreclosure, and they had packed everything they could fit 
inside their station wagon and were headed across country to live with family so they could get back on their feet. It wasn't unusual for my dad, the mechanic, to stop and help people he saw having car trouble, but it was the first time I could remember him ever bringing them home. This family was helpless, hopeless, broke, and in need of a break. And my dad just followed his instincts, probably realizing they were in need of a little more than a few car repairs. And so while my dad worked on their car, my mom fed this family both some delicious food and her country hospitality and made them feel so welcome and comfortable that for a little while they forgot to feel awkward or embarrassed at their neediness. This was the classroom of day-to-day life with my parents, where I witnessed firsthand their genuine humility and empathy, their deep kindness and compassion, and their unwavering generosity even when their own resources were minimal. My parents' way of life was deeply rooted in their steadfast faith that they had been created for something greater than to just pursue their own success and happiness. Their greatest legacy was that they modeled for me what a life lived in balance, what a difference it could make. A balance between what I do and who I am while I do it. My parents may have been my first teachers, but they were not my last. Over my lifetime, God has placed many people in my life who continued my lessons on finding balance. I've had spiritual leaders and professors and coaches and teachers and friends who spent time with me, who poured into me, and whose lessons were invisibly but indelibly woven into the tapestry of my life, organically preparing me for late night needs and desperate phone calls and hard conversations. One of my best balance teachers was Deanna, one of my college roommates. I was a year older than Deanna and had already established some routines for daily college life and church life when she came to ACU her freshman year. So for the first few months, Deanna kind of followed me around in my routines, but soon the lessons would begin. I remember the time we walked into church on a Sunday, and I headed right toward the section where all the college students gathered to sit together every, every week, and I realized Deanna wasn't with me. And so I began to look for her, and she's all the way across the auditorium talking to an elderly couple sitting all alone. So I headed over there, and when I arrived, Deanna introduced me to Harry and Lucy, who turned out to be this amazing couple with a late-in-life love story, and who basically adopted the two of us as their granddaughters throughout our time in Abilene. I can remember times we'd walk through our school's cafeteria, and I'd be headed with my tray over to the table where our friends sat, and I would see Deanna veer off to a table where someone sat alone. And she would ask if she could sit with them, as if they were doing her the favor. Before that first year with Deanna watching and following her, I would have never considered going outside my comfort zone in that way to meet new people or to look outside myself on how to help somebody else like she was showing me how to do by her example. But I've done it hundreds of times since. And those small decisions made daily continue to bring my life balance. And so when graduation came... I was ready. I was ready to not only tackle the nuts and bolts of teaching the various courses and the sports I've coached over the past 33 years, but I was equally ready to engage in the lives of my students, my athletes, and my youth group. I was ready for not only the organized, thought out, and planned for parts of my profession, but also the hard, the messy, and the unpredictable. Because I had spent years developing a balance between preparing for my profession and pursuing my passion for people. And that is why as an educator, I often feel the urge to apologize to the students of the 21st century. In many ways, the guardians of their educational journeys have set them up for an unbalanced life. Through the heavy focus on high stakes testing and the tunnel vision pursuit of high GPAs, impressive resumes, And rankings that impress colleges enough to get an acceptance letter. And then when they get to college, same song, next verse. Get the highest GPA you can and build the best, most impressive resume you can. This time, so that the company you want to work for will hire you. But when the main focus of their lives has been pursuing GPAs and building resumes, there's often not a lot of room left for doing things that would bring balance to their lives. Now, let me be clear. 
GPAs and resumes are important. Students, do not go home and tell your parents I said otherwise. Because they do paint a picture of a potential student or employee that is necessary. But I have a little secret that I want to let everyone in on. But this might get me in trouble. So I want you guys to keep this between you and me. Can we do that? All right, here it comes. About five minutes after graduation, from both high school and college, no one's really going to ever ask you what your GPA was again. And that's problematic. If all you've done for four years of high school and then four years of college is to put all your attention and pour all of your effort into pursuing only one kind of success, that of getting the best grades, sometimes at great costs, to get the best jobs. It's only not problematic if all you want to do with the rest of your life is work. But who wants that? And that is why I feel like we owe this generation an apology. Because too often high school resembles a hard-driven, one-lane road that invites students into a very narrow space where expectations promote the lie that a student's most important identity rests in their GPA. And that mentality often sticks and students become adults who too often believe the lie that their most important identity rests in their job evaluations, promotions, and pay stubs. And that is off balance. And if that's your story, it's time to fight back. It's time to add another lane to the road you're traveling. It's time to intentionally invite some balance into your life. One of my favorite speakers and authors is Bob Goff. And he said something in his book, Love Does, that I had to reread several times before I could fully grasp what he was saying. And now I can't forget it. He said, I used to be afraid of failing at things that really mattered to me. But now I'm more afraid of failing, excuse me, of succeeding at things that don't matter. So how do we invite this often elusive balance into our crazy, busy lives? I have a suggestion. I have one suggestion I want to offer to you today. Begin giving as much attention to your LPA as you do your GPA, your resume, or your daily planner. What is your LPA, you ask? I'm so glad you asked. Your LPA is your life point average. And it reveals to yourself and to others what you're doing with your life that matters to someone besides you. Students spend time each and every day doing work that enhances their GPA. And adults do work each and every day that enhances their job performance. But what if we intentionally spent time each and every day doing something that made a difference in the life of another. Now don't faint on me. I'm not talking about time consuming things. I'm not even talking about things you have to plan for. What if we just adopted the thinking of Mother Teresa who once said, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. Small things, great love, manageable. It's about making an impact on someone who's right in front of you. Or as Anna, one of my second-year PAL students, puts it, it's not about impacting a lot of people. It's about impacting individuals importantly. So what if you just took the time to hold the door open for someone coming behind you? What if you smiled, just smiled, at one of the hard-working custodians who work in your building? What if you added a high five? Learned a name. And used it. What if you stopped on your way out of a classroom or a boardroom or a meeting room and said to the teacher or the presenter, wow, that was such a great lesson or presentation. And it's clear to me you put a lot of time in preparing for it. That was great. What if you chose to invite the student or the fellow employee sitting alone at lunch to sit with you? What if you said thanks to your mom or your wife for working all day at work and coming home and making a meal for the family? What if you chose not to pass on gossip about someone who wasn't there to defend him or herself? What if you left a note for a waiter or waitress who had done a really great job serving you? What if you left a note for a waiter or waitress who hadn't done a good job serving you with the hopes that with some encouragement they would be a great waiter for their next guests? 
What if you gave up your next in line spot in the checkout queue at Kroger to a young mother with a cart full of groceries with a wrestling toddler, wrestling a crying toddler? All of these things just take noticing. Not a lot of time, no extra effort really, and no money. Just noticing, looking up, away from your screens, seeing what is going on around you. I mean, actually seeing the people who impact your life every day and then doing something with what you notice. Doing something that makes a difference in the life of another. And therein lies the heart of the LPA. Bringing balance to our own lives by making the lives of others better. You want to be the best version of yourself? Help others be the best versions of themselves. I know it sounds crazy, but in my experience, the most whole, well-adjusted, successful people I know are those who also make everyone around them better. But it all starts with finding balance for yourself. So I have a question for you. What lights you up? What gives you life? Is it your family or friends? Music or journaling or reading? Something that hasn't been assigned? Exercising? Creating? Inventing? Traveling? Exploring? Or maybe it's your faith like it's been for me. But whatever your answer is to that question, make time for it to be a priority in your life so that as you continue on your journey to do whatever it is you want to be able to do as doctors or detectives or dry cleaners librarians or lawyers or lab technicians architects or accountants or anesthesiologists musicians magicians or mail handlers Safety inspectors, saddle makers, or stay-at-home parents. Whatever it is you're drawn to do, you'll be prepared to be your best. The best because you'll have spent your time preparing for your profession while balancing your life with your passions. The things that light you up. The things that give you life. And you'll be a better, stronger, more enduring version of yourself. And that will allow you to help others be the best versions of themselves. And in doing so, you will create a legacy for your life that will outlive your life. Thank you.